Good morning, everyone.
Alrighty, good morning again, and uh, good to have you all with us. Could you turn your Bibles to the Epistle of Jude? Go to verse 1. The Epistle of Jude, the book just before Revelation, for those of you unfamiliar with this book. And we're going to wrap up our study of Jude 9 today by noting that the account of Michael's confrontation with the devil appears in what we call a pseudepigraphic work called The Assumption of Moses. So we're going to talk about that a little bit along with this passage. And uh, so that'll be our subject here today. And uh, again, uh, if you're, um, as far as announcements are concerned, uh, if you're new to the ministry, I like to give these announcements because there's people always popping in and uh, they're new, whether it's through our podcasts, never heard of us before, whether it's our podcast and iTunes, Spotify, Amazon Music, or Faith Life Sermons website where we put our MP3s, MP3s and befores, or our Wenchin.org site, and, uh, or Faith uh, YouTube. Uh, so uh, there's always people popping in, streaming live video by YouTube here. Some people might be in here for the first time. I don't know. So there's always new people coming in. I find that out because people message me or they start subscribing to us on uh, YouTube or I get an email through from uh, through our webstream.org site. So uh, for those of you new, we're an expository type ministry. My name is Bill Wenstrom, a pastor ordained in 1998 uh, out of a church in Grace Bible Church in Somerset, Massachusetts. And uh, I... Um, we're an expository type ministry. That means we go through the different books of the Bible, verse by verse, paragraph by paragraph, book by book. We all try to alternate between Old Testament and New Testament. And right now we're currently studying Jude, uh, the, the epistle of Jude. And uh, and also we like to do various subjects in between books. And uh, the last one, we did Forgiveness of Sins recently, the Doctrine of Prayer, I think last year, and uh, the Antichrist, we did it in between books before we did Second Thessalonians. So we've done, and also we did Redemption, Propitiation, Reconciliation, the finished work of Christ before we did the Epistle of Jude after we finished Habakkuk. So uh, that's, uh, that's what we do in all of our classes, a recorded video and audio. Uh, we use streaming video by YouTube for our live broadcasts, and we also take that recording and put it on our, you know, our uh, Wenstrom.org site. Uh, prior to uh, August of 2019, uh, we used to put all our MP3 and MP4s on our Wenstrom.org site. Uh, but uh, in the last, since we moved back to Massachusetts in 2019 of June, we uh, starting in June of uh, August of 2019, we put all of our MP3 four, MP4s on our Faith Thy Sermon site, which we've had for a while. So I put a lot of our, we're almost done finishing uh, uploading the Genesis series and I'm halfway, almost halfway through with Revel, uh, Romans. So um, everything that we have on our Wednesday.org site will be on there. And also... Uh, we have um, we have a website at Academia Edu, which is doing very well. We're in the top one percent of uh, views. We got like 750,000 views, over 800 followers now, and that was we've only been on there since 2017. I put a lot of my written articles there. Over 700 are on that website. All of our written articles, everything I've ever done, which is over 1,700 articles, and uh, and also I, I I was looking at uh, yes yeah, over 700 700 um, articles on our, um, uh, our 1,700 written articles in PDF format on our wenstrom.org site. And that we have the exegesis and exposition in great detail of all the books we've ever done, uh, studies we've ever done, and also various doctrinal subjects, people in the Bible like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Paul, um, a Greek word studies section. We have a, a, a prep school for t you know classes for the kids on our website as well. Which, uh, and just look on our home tab, you'll see uh, prep school and and so we uh, so we've uh, I did I used to do the the the, um, the lessons where I was ordained I used to do the lessons for years well, like seven eight years over at uh, uh, GBC Grace Bible Church in, in Somerset I used to do the, the uh, run the prep school there for years so I did all the lessons there so uh, anyways um, and I took, took a lot of them I put up on our web website but uh, also. Um, our class schedule is, is Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursdays at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, um, and uh, if you uh, and so that's going to change as and this, which leads to my something I've been announcing. I was just uh, uh, selected to be uh, the pastor uh, to succeed Pastor Buddy Peak at Doctrinal Bible Church in some, Huntsville, Alabama, and I'll be moving down there toward the very end of the month of June, and uh, my first uh, service teaching there will be on Sunday, July 10th. Is, so we're planning on that. And they do two sessions, two 45-minute sessions on Sundays with a break in between. And also, they'll be, we'll be teaching on Wednesday nights down there as well. They asked me about that. I said, sure. And, uh, but uh, they're not 
they're not pushing me to do that. That's something that was very, 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 very thoughtful, very considerate of me because it's a big move down to Huntsville. So uh, they're sending somebody up uh, to uh, with a U-Haul, you know, get a U-Haul up here, and then they're going to drive back my stuff or load up the truck. My stuff has been sitting in, most of my stuff has been sitting in storage for three years, like my library. <laughs> it's all that, and uh, so it should be interesting. And um, and then some of my some of my stuff is, uh, the essential stuff is in my, my parents' house where I'm actually broadcasting and I live. Um, so uh, yeah, we'll be, that'll, uh, and so the Wenstrom Bible Ministries Sunday class will be uh, starting in, uh, on su Tuesday, August 2nd. Will begin at uh, on Saturdays at 11 a.m. So we're just moving the Wednesday Bible Ministries Sunday class to bumping it up to Saturday at 11 a.m. So the start times on each of those classes will continue. So we're we're gonna our last class. We usually take a summer break since I've been out here in. Uh, I've always taken a summer break, and uh, but since in Massachusetts, since the last three years, I usually take a month in Ju in July and also a month around Christmas time. So um, we're gonna have we're gonna have our. Uh, so I, uh, a summer break coming up shortly. So our last class before the summer break for Winston Bible Ministries will be uh, Sunday, June 26th. And then we'll resume classes Tuesday, August 2nd. So keep this moving prayer. I hope to be back online with no problem, uh, you know, getting online um, down there in Huntsville. Um, and uh, so I'll, I'll be having, I'll have an, my office in, actually in the church. So it'll be the first time I've ever had an, an office not, that wasn't in my home. So I won't be eat, sleeping, and working at, at in my same pl the place where I live. So um, I'm looking forward to that. So, um, so I so we'll we'll get um, so I, I, we'll, we'll, so we'll we're planning on resuming classes Tuesday, August second. So keep there's a lot of moving parts, a lot of things going on. And this is a lot, quite frankly, this will be a lot easier move for me than it was from going from Iowa to to, to Massachusetts, for the simple reason there was a lot of uncertainty as to how Western Bible Ministries would continue. So. Uh, but uh, the Lord was faithful, and thank you for the people who prayed for this ministry and supported this ministry financially, which leads to me to, if you, if you feel led to contribute, um, uh, you can write a check to us at Winston Bible Ministries, P.O. Box 541, Norwood, Massachusetts, 02062. Of course, that's going to be changing. As soon as I get that information, I'll, uh, I'll let you know uh, where I'm going to have uh, the mail for the Winston Bible Ministries go. I already have a dress for the place where I'm living, so I might have it sent there. We'll see. But um, also... Um, you can also give through PayPal, and that's a lot very, very convenient for a lot of people. So there's some people do the checks, some people send us something, and some people do it through PayPal. And uh, so uh, and uh, so that's uh, um, if you, you know, of course Galatians six six says those who taught the word of God share with good things with those who teach him. And of course, you're benefiting from the, the ministry. Then that passage says that you're obligated to help us out. And uh, that's uh, so. I'm working for the body of Christ, and so uh, when you when you if you're a plumber, you expect to get paid for the services that you provide people. So, I'm providing people services in the body of Christ, namely the, the communication of the Word of God. And uh, I don't charge for our teachings; never have, never will. And uh, so uh, I'm totally uh, at the you know the mercy of God, of course, like we all are. But uh, I, I, you know, the, I'm, it's all up to people whether they respond to what the Spirit's teaching. So. Which can make it very. So I have to walk by faith. I don't, you know, and uh, and and uh, that the people, God will move, raise up people to help us out. So I thank you for those who've been uh, obeying Galatians six six and, and and reciprocating and helping us out here. We could use it right now, especially with this move. So, anyways, I think that's about it for um, the announcements. And uh, let's take a moment of silent prayer. This is our custom. Oh, by the way, Happy Father's Day to everyone. Uh, and my, uh, my my brother Jimmy and I and his son Andrew, who's an excellent golfer, and the four of us uh, went to a Father's Day uh, golf uh, tournament that we usually go to. Uh, it's every June, and uh, a, f a family of uh, friends of ours run it. And so uh, there's a lot of people there. And so I did pretty well. I hit an 80, had an 86. Not bad at 40, 41 in the back and 45 in the in the front. And uh, almost came, one, almost one closest to the pin on one par three, and I thought I had a hole in one. It just rolled right by the pin. It was unbelievable. But guy beat me by a foot. So I was six, I was fourteen feet away, and he was he was thirteen. So, anyway, so it was a great it was a great time. He had good, had a blast. It was down in Lakeville, uh, Massachusetts, and so uh, it was a lot of fun. So happy Father's Day to everybody, and uh, let's uh, let's take that moment of silent prayer. This is our custom. We take a moment of silent prayer to examine ourselves and determine if we are 
and fellowship with God because any mental, verbal, or overt act of sin that we knowingly commit could cause us to lose fellowship with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But according to 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins to the Father, He, God the Father, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. In other words, He purifies us from each and every wrongdoing. We maintain that fellowship by obeying the Spirit who speaks to us through the Scriptures which He's inspired. And that's when we're obeying the commands of Ephesians 5.18 to be filled with the Spirit and Colossians 3.16 to let the Word of Christ richly dwell in our souls. So if there's anything that's bothering you, disturbing and distracting to you, do what 1 Peter 5.7 says, cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because He cares for you. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us, another day to study your word. We thank you for your faithfulness to this ministry. Thank you for your faithfulness to myself and uh, in continuing uh, this ministry here in Massachusetts the last three years and through all the trials and tribulations with my family issues and the ministry and coming from Iowa to Massachusetts. And we just thank you for this new opportunity at Doctrinal Bible Church in Huntsville. I thank you, Father, for the people there. Thank you for the people at Winston Bible Ministries over the years. That is supporting and carrying on with the uh, the teaching here with me. I thank you for each and every one of them. I, I just pray, Father, for this upcoming move to Alabama that you'll have your hand upon it. I know you'll get me there safely. I pray you get us there safely uh, with Bob coming up to help me. And I just pray, Father, that uh, you give us traveling mercies. And I just pray no one we get hurt moving anything. <laughs> and I just pray, Father, that we just uh, get down there with no problems and get uh, situated uh, very quickly. So I can uh, get, just get, jump right into it. I just uh, pray, Father, that you would uh, use me mightily uh, in, in both Western Bible Ministries and also down there at Doctrinal Bible Church in Huntsville and use the people for both ministries mightily. And I uh, just pray, Father, that today that you would bless us in the study of Jude 9 as we wrap up the study of this great verse and controversial verse and very mysterious. And I just pray, Father, by the power of the Spirit, that you would use me mightily as your instrument and help me to communicate by the Spirit your full counsel today with regards to this passage in Jude 9, to do so with accuracy and clarity, reverence, respect, and power, so I can minister to your people and any unsaved. I pray, Father, that your people in the audience, whether they're alive or through the recordings, I thank you for them. I just pray that you would help them by the power of the Spirit to understand and concentrate and apply what they're being taught, to enjoy the Word of God, and I just pray, Father, you break down any barriers that sin and Satan might put up that would hinder that from happening. And if there's people in the audience that are not Christians, uh, I just thank you for them, and I pray that by the power of the Spirit, they'll be able to understand the gospel so that they can make a decision to either accept or reject your Son, Jesus Christ, the Savior. We know, of course, Father, that you desire all people to be saved and come to an experiential knowledge of the truth. I also pray, Father, that you would uh, the, uh, the technology will function properly. I thank you for it, and the people taking advantage of it. I pray there be no problems with the recordings, the video, and the audio, and upload these things to our various websites, podcasts, the media platforms that you've given to us, and I pray you use those mightily and protect them from the evil one. So, Father, we pray for this service, in our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ's name, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. Please turn in your Bibles to the Epistle of Jude. Go to Jude, verse 1, and we'll start off reading from uh, the, NI, uh, the, the Net Bible. We'll start off reading from the Net Bible. Look at Jude, verse 1. We'll read the first nine verses. And, um, of course, I forgot to put this on airplane mode, of course. Even though, my, that was my phone that dinged off. And even though I have it on, uh, I don't know what, I must have did something wrong, but I have it on uh, Do Not Disturb. And I usually turn it off and put it in airplane mode. So, if you got your phone, turn, put it on airplane mode. So, I'm sorry about the, the, the phone uh, ringing there or the, the text coming in from my brothers or something. Anyway, so they got those group, t group texts. So look at uh, Jude verse 1. I'm going to read the first nine verses and then we'll look at verse 9 in detail. So it says in Jude 1 in the Net Bible, it says, From Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, wrapped in the love of God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy, peace, and love be lavished on you. That's the introduction to the letter. Now the body of the letter begins. Dear friends, although I've been eager to write to you about our common salvation, I now feel compelled instead to write to encourage you to contend earnestly 
for the faith that was once and for all entrusted to the saints. So Jude is saying that uh, uh, he was intending to write about their common salvation, but he now had to switch gears because of a crisis had developed and he wants them now to, he wants to encourage and exhort them to contend earnestly for the Christian faith, that body of doctrine that the Christian church believes and is taught and is found in our Old Testament and New Testament today. And then he gives the reason why for this. He says in verse four, for certain men, certain people, have secretly slipped in among you who long ago were marked out for the condemnation I'm about to describe, that that condemnation is described in in verses uh, five through uh, 16. Ungodly men, so they're unregenerate, who have turned the grace of our God into a license for evil who, and who deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. When he says they slipped in secretly among you, that means they didn't understand uh, the, the, the intention of them joining their Christian meetings. They thought they might be people who were interested in, in uh, what they was going on. Unfortunately, they didn't realize that these people had slipped in into the meetings and they didn't know the intention for them joining their meetings. It wasn't that they wanted to become Christians, is that they were trying to get them uh, to um, join their movement. As we pointed out, these individuals are not false teachers. There's no identification of them as being explicitly false teachers, and neither is there the nature of their teaching. Uh, false teaching is actually presented in this epistle, which you would expect if this was a crisis about false teaching, and you would expect a description of their teaching. But we don't have that. Uh, these are actually, they're not Gnostics. We've gone over this in our introduction, and they're not Gnostics because there's no evidence in the letter that there's any kind of reference to Gnosticism here. Or in, in this case, in the first century, it would be a, a, an incipient form of Gnosticism uh, that was in its uh, Gnosticism in its infancy, in other words. And uh, we saw some uh, incipient form of Gnosticism in Colossians 2, and also we saw Gnosticism in its infancy in First and Second and Third John with Docetic Gnosticism. But we don't have that in this epistle. There's no evidence for this being Gnostic teaches. And, but we came to the conclusion that, uh, that uh, this is a Jewish zealots, they're unsaved Jewish zealots in the first century who were pers- trying to persuade the citizens of Judah, Judah uh, and uh, Israel, in other words, in the first century to join them in their rebellion against uh, the Roman Empire because they wanted to bring in the kingdom of God on earth and by rebelling against the uh, the Romans, they believed that this would prompt the Messiah to come back and establish the kingdom of God on earth. Uh, they believed in the sole rule of God. That means they didn't believe that they had to be accountable to the Roman, uh, the uh, ro- occupying forces of Rome and Caesar. And uh, they also believed in the, they were zealous for the law. They got their inspiration from the Maccabeans who uh, rebelled against Antiochus Epiphanes IV in the second century BC and were successful. Uh, but uh, these individuals, they believed in the law too, like the Maccabeans, and they were uh, they were very loyal to it. And uh, they believed the book of Daniel, and they actually interpreted Daniel chapter 7 and the fourth beast correctly as being Rome. However, they didn't realize, because they didn't have the spirit, they didn't believe in Jesus as their savior. And uh, therefore, they were uh, deceived into thinking that the Messiah would come back during that stage of the Roman Empire. However, the, 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 the Bible teaches and the Christian teaching teaches the Old Testament and New Testament, Jesus and the Apostles, that the Messiah would come back during the final stage of the Roman Empire, which is depicted on the fourth beast in Daniel chapter 7 with the ten horns and the, the little horn, which is Antichrist, who would rule a ten-nation European confederacy. And that's what the ten horns represent in that, on that seventh, uh, fourth beast in Daniel chapter 7. So uh, these individuals uh, led the nation into destruction, they were one of the four great pillars of Jewish society in the first century, as we've been pointing out. You had the Pharisees, the Sadducees, you had these scenes in the Dead Sea uh, area, and then you had these Jewish zealots who began their rebellion uh, with Judas, uh, the, uh, the, um, the Galilean. And uh, we saw in Mark 3.16 that Peter was one of those individuals. He's called Simon the Zealot. And uh, it's interesting, uh, so uh, a lot of people didn't think that movement had... Uh, uh, had been in, in, in when Mark wrote his gospel that uh, this movement was not a big movement at the time. They're wrong. Of course they were. Uh, the uh, Judas the Galilean was killed by the Romans, and his his descendants carried on the cause to to uh, to uh, rebel against Rome and to, in order to prompt the Messiah to establish the kingdom of God on earth and thus usurp the authority, get the Romans out of Judea, and so. Uh, these individuals, uh, Simon, Peter was a, a part of this movement at one time. He's called Simon the Zealot. 
And uh, of course, it's interesting, you know, Jesus came from Galilee, you know, Peter was, Peter was in Galilee, you know, the, apostle, the apostles were, and you see that uh, the Judas, the Galilean, he came from Galilee himself. So this movement started in the area that Jesus was and, 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 and Peter, James, and John. Had, uh, were living in that area, so they so so it looks like Peter was one of these individuals. So uh, he ends up leaving that movement and begins with Jesus. So a lot of people actually thought that Jesus might be a zealot. Of course, uh, he didn't resort to violence like the zealots did. They resorted to political assassinations, whether it was the Roman civil authorities or the Jewish civil authorities that they thought were being uh, traitorous by going over to the Romans and capitulating to the Romans. And, you know, um, and, and collecting taxes for them. So uh, this is the, the, the circumstances in which Jude is writing this letter, and he, was, he wanted to, this, the point of this letter was to, uh, to protect the recipients of this letter who were Christians in the Jewish Christian community in, Gal in, in Judea in the first century AD. And so Jude is trying to protect them from these Jewish zealots. He doesn't want them to join this movement uh, and, uh, for, for, another, for a couple of reasons. One, uh, they were rejecting two major doctrines of the Christian faith. One, the second advent of Christ, and which contends that Jesus would start uh, establish the kingdom of God on earth through the exercise of his own divine omnipotence at his second advent. And, uh, of course, the, the Jewish zealots had rejected Jesus and thus rejected his doctrine of the second advent, which is actually uh, taught in the Old Testament as well. Zechariah 12, 14, Habakkuk 3, verses 3 through 15, as we saw in the past, and Revelation 19 and 20, the Gall of the Discourse of Matthew 24, the Lord's. So uh, these individuals also, uh, they rejected that. They also rejected uh, the Christian teaching about uh, re obedience to the, the governmental civil authorities unless you have biblical justification. So they were rejecting the, the, the governmental authorities of not only the Romans, but also their own Jewish civil authorities who they thought were traitorous and, and were uh, capitulating to the Romans. So uh, Jude didn't want these uh, the Christian community in Judea to reject the Christian teaching about obedience to the governmental authorities and reject the uh, the uh, the second the doctrine of the second advent of Christ. So those are the two doctrines that they needed to contend for that were part of the Christian faith. So these are the individuals that are being referenced here and just first described in this letter in Jude four. Then we have verse five. It says, "Now I desire to remind you, even though you've been fully informed of these facts, that." once and for all you have, that Jesus, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, later destroyed those who did not believe. That's the Exodus generation. They died the sin to death. They did not lose their salvation, as we pointed out. Then it says in verse 6, you also know that the angels who did not keep within their proper domain but abandoned their own place of residence, he is kept in eternal chains in utter darkness, locked up for the judgment of the great day. These are the angels of Genesis 6, the sons of God, who uh, these fallen angels, uh, uh, they, as we pointed out in great detail, uh, we did had two weeks of classes on this verse, these uh, fallen angels of Satan that are mentioned in Genesis 6, the sons of God, the Benaha Elohim, they, they possessed uh, unregenerate men in order to have sex with unregenerate women so that they, in the offspring were the Nephilim. They weren't half men, half angels. The text says they were human beings. And so what Satan was trying to do is corrupt through these, uh, these, this Neph these Nephilim, he was trying to corrupt the, the behavior of the human race, so much so that God would be caused to judge it. And that's exactly what he did. However, he held aside for himself, set aside for himself, Noah and his family who continued on the human race, uh, continued to perpetuate the human race after the flood of Noah, during the days of Noah. So the, the whole purpose of this uh, um, attempt by Satan was simply to prevent the incarnation of the Son of God from taking place. He wanted to destroy the human race, as I just described, and so that the this Messiah, could, the, the Son of God, could not become a human being and, and defeat Satan, which was, remember the Lord said in Genesis 3.15 that uh, descendant of Ab Ab uh, Adam and Eve would destroy the devil. And uh, and they'll, uh, 1 John 3, 8 says, Jesus destroyed the works of the devil during his first advent with his crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and session at the right hand of the Father. And then he will have re Satan removed from the earth and the fallen angels for a thousand years at his second advent. So that is who's, that is who's being referenced there in verse 6. Then we have in verse 7, so also Sodom and Gomorrah and the neighboring towns, since they indulged in sexual immorality, 
and pursued a natural desire in a way similar to these angels are now displayed as an example by suffering the punishment of eternal fire. So as we pointed out, these three examples from the Old Testament are examples that God judges those who rebel against him and against his authority. And the rebellions of each of these groups were different. The Exodus generation was unrepentant unbelief. We saw that from the book of Numbers and then in Deuteronomy. And also the angels, their sin was uh, leaving the, the, the sphere of, of or activity ordained by God for the angels. And, not, and so they invaded the human realm by deeming, possessing the bodies of these unregenerate men. And so, therefore, uh, that was their sin. And then, verse 7, uh, the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, the citizens of the cities around them, Adma and Zeboim, their sin was homosexuality. So they man- each of these groups manifested their rebellion against the Lord in different ways. And so, and the reason why these three examples is because he's telling the Christian community in Judea, Judas, that these Jewish zealots that are surreptitiously joining their meetings are going to be judged like these three groups of the Old Testament were judged for their rebellion. So the Jewish zealots were manifesting their rebellion by uh, uh, rejecting Roman governmental uh, uh, occupation of Judea. And then we have another description, uh, three more descriptions of these Jewish zealots in verse 8. Yet these men, as a result of their dreams, as we pointed out, the word there for dreams is uh, not uh, not referring, it's, an, it's, a, it's not a, a good translation, as we saw in my translation of verse 8. We went in great deal t- detail why we shouldn't be translating, uh, talking about dreams there. My translation of verse 8, nevertheless, despite this in a similar manner, these also on the one hand are defiling their bodies, while on the other hand, they're rejecting human governmental authority, and on the other hand, they're disrespecting angelic beings. Why? Because they're delusional to their own detriment. It's not dreams that's involved here. It's they're delusional, thinking that they could throw off the yoke of Rome. So we see that they're, they defile the flesh and they reject governmental authority. And when it says they insult the glorious ones, it's talking about the angels, as you could see in my translation. They, and uh, by rejecting the governmental authorities of Rome, they were actually not only rejecting God, Okay, who ordained government, uh, human government uh, after the flood. Uh, we see that uh, by rejecting the g- governmental authorities of Rome, they were actually rejecting not only God's authority, but Satan's authority, because Satan has authority over the nations. He's the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. He has power over the world, 1 John 5.19. That's why the world is a mess. And, uh, and also, we, also because we're sinners too. And so uh, Satan... Uh, he has temporary authority over the earth. Remember, he he offered the, the kingdoms of this world to Jesus. And remember, in his temptation, this is a legitimate temptation. It wouldn't have been if he didn't have authority over the nations. He does. How did he get that? Well, he usurped the authority of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Remember, Garden of Eden, uh, remember God had ordained Adam and Eve and their descendants to rule over the works of his hands, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. But Satan usurped that authority by getting them to disobey God and eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, Jesus, the Son of God, became a human being in order to restore mankind over the rulership of this earth. And he is, uh, he is uh, through his crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and session, the right hand of the Father, he has taken back the authority of planet earth. He has the title deed to planet earth. That's what the seven-sealed scroll of Revelation 5 is all about. And, of course, everyone now... Uh, ever since his his uh, ascension in his in heaven and seated at the right hand of the Father, ever since the day of Pentecost, uh, he is everybody believes in him, is identified with him in his crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, session at the right hand of the Father, and they become members of his body, and they also become his bride, and so now the church and Jesus will rule over the works of God's hands, and thus restoring humanity as the rightful rulers of this earth. And uh, so that is what uh, we have going on here. These uh, J- these Jewish zealots, by rejecting the Roman governmental authorities, which were under the authority of Satan, they were uh, they were actually rejecting Satan's authority. They didn't know it, and they, they were ignorant of this. So then we have verse 9. And uh, now we have a contrast between uh, those who reject the governmental authorities and God, thus God's authority, angelic authority, 
uh, now we have Michael who stands in contrast to these Jewish zealots because it says in verse 9, but even when Michael, that's the archangel of God, was arguing with the devil and debating with him concerning Moses' body, he did not dare to bring a slanderous judgment, but said, may the Lord rebuke you. Now, we're going to read from Deuteronomy 34 again, as we did last week, about the account of Moses' death. We don't have any uh, anything in the Old Testament that talks about Michael arguing over the body of Moses uh, with the devil. Uh, we find this in a pseudepigraphic work, as we'll see, the assumption of Moses and God. Uh, the Holy Spirit saw fit to have Jude put this down in Scripture, even though it's not found in the Old Testament. And, uh, and even though it's a pseudepigraphic work, the Holy Spirit said it was okay to put it in Scripture because simply it's a historical fact. That's the only reason why the Holy Spirit had Jude put this down. So in contrast to the Jewish zealots in the first century who were rejecting Roman governmental authority and, uh, and, and consequently Satan's authority and thus God's authority, because Satan's under God's authority, we see that Michael stands in contrast to these Jewish zealots and that he respected the authority of Satan. And so uh, we see that's very important. So uh, the Christian should respect the governmental authorities because they're under Satan's authority. And even Michael, the elect angel of God, who is the ruler over Israel in the angelic realm, he didn't even make a slanderous accusation against the devil, who's the author of evil. So where do we get off rejecting governmental authority? We must have biblical justification to do that in the Christian community. So that's why Jude put this account in verse 9 of this epistle, because he wants the Jewish Christian community, remember, to respect the governmental authorities. And if you don't, you're rejecting Satan's authority, and thus God's authority, because God, uh, Satan is under God's authority, ultimately. So we need to follow the example of Michael the archangel. And so... Uh, there are times, as we pointed out, when you can, you're can you justified to rebel against the governmental authorities. In the Old Testament, we have several examples, in, and we have one major one in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew, Hebrew midwives were told by Pharaoh that they must kill the infant Jewish baby boys once they're born. They lied to Pharaoh, saying that we couldn't do it because these Hebrew midwives, uh, they give birth so quickly, and they were uh, the kids were already alive and gone but by the time we came to, to, to do the job. And so that's justified civil disobedience because murder is, is, is genocide is sin. And then we have uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel chapter 3. They, uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar ordered his, everybody in his empire to bow down to the image that he created in the plain of Dura. They rejected that decree and they suffered the consequences, which was capital punishment, but the Lord delivered them. And uh, consequently, Nebuchadnezzar was actually saved because of that. And uh, th that's justified civil disobedience because idolatry is sin. And then Daniel was told not to pray according to the Persian ruler's decree in Daniel 6. He disobeyed that and he suffered the consequences, capital punishment. But the Lord, like with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, delivered him in the lion's den. So that was justified civil disobedience because uh, that's sin not to pray to God. And then we have uh, Peter, James, and John were told by the Jewish Sanhedrin not to preach the gospel. They disobeyed that decree. And so that's justified civil disobedience. We have nothing, there was nothing in the first century that corresponded to that, which would give justification for the Jewish zealots to rebel against the governmental authorities in Rome. In fact, it was God's will that the Jewish nation during the times of the Gentiles would be subjugated, subjugated to the, the Gentile world powers. And that will continue up to the second advent of Christ when not only the times of the Gentiles will end with the second advent of Christ, but also the 70th week of Daniel. So uh, we have uh, the, these, uh, Jewish, uh, these uh, Jewish zealots were rejecting uh, the angelic authority of Satan by rejecting the Roman governmental authorities. So Michael was is an example for us to follow. So there was nothing in the first century that uh, would give justification to these Jewish zealots to rebel against Rome. There's nothing today in the 21st century in America which would give biblical justification for Christians to rebel against the, the American the United States government. And uh, so this is very important because we're coming up in 2024 to another election. So if you don't like your leaders, you can vote them out. And thank God that you have that ability to in this country still. And so we must be very, and, uh, and, and though if you're in the military, in any area of the military, and you're a Christian, 
do not get involved in revolting against the government and the, and the president's authority. Uh, you, you have problems with the last election, okay, got it, but we must, we must follow the law. We're a country full of, uh, that's governed by laws. So let it go to the courts. You can go to the which has been trying, which has been going on, and so uh, I haven't seen anything that would say that uh, the that the last election was not on the up and up. Uh, they're going through the they're going through the pro legal process. We must follow the law and follow the legal process, and uh, we so because that's what we are a nation governed by laws. So we must be careful about what we're doing unless we have evidence, clear evidence, that the, the, the last election was a sham, then we must continue to obey the governmental authorities here. And another election is coming up. So we, as Christians, we must be people who are law-abiding citizens. We pay our taxes. We must uh, be individuals who uh, respect the authority of the police officer, the president, the, 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 the vice president, the executive, judicial, legislative branches of our federal, state, and local governments. That's what Christians are supposed to do. Romans 13, 1 through 7 teaches us that. 1 Peter 2, 13 through 18, and Titus 3, 1. And when Peter and, and, and Paul wrote those things to the Christian community, Nero was on the throne. He had both Peter and John executed. And remember Jesus. Remember this. Jesus was, talk, talk about someone who suffered travesty of justice. Jesus was, Pilate, who condemned Jesus to death, saw that he was innocent. And he saw that the Jewish authorities were just railroading him because they were envious of Jesus. And so they, Jesus suffered the death penalty. When Jesus was on the cross or after, on his, after his resurrection, did he decree that now all governmental authority must reject? No, he didn't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Yes, Pilate abused his authority and people will abuse their authority and government authority and it's done so in the past and will do so in the future. They're going to be held to account by the Lord. Nobody's getting away with anything. Nobody is getting away with anything nobody ever has. Not Hitler, not Stalin, not Kennedy, not Reagan, not Lincoln, Washington, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, not Caesar. It doesn't matter who they are, what a ruler they are, they all are held to account. That's what the Bible teaches. And every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So Christians must be people who have authority orientation and it starts in the home. It starts by teaching your kids to respect your authority as a parent and the wife must obey, I'm talking to Christian marriages now, the wife is to obey her husband and all things is under the Lord and the husband is to love his wife like Christ loved the church and just because you're, just because you're under the authority of your husband doesn't mean you're less of a human being or at all, you're you're a child of God just like your husband, but so the husband is needs to be uh, loving his wife like Christ loved the church, and so the children must be taught to respect their parents' authority, and we have a problem in our country because we have a problem in the home. We have divorces rampant in our country, and it's listen to me, it's high in the Christian community. It's higher in the Bible Belt in the Christian community divorces than among non-Christians and the Bible Belt. How's that for statistics? And I believe it, every because the Christian community is becoming more and more indistinguishable to the non-Christian community, which is the reason why the Christian community has lost its influence in this country. We're trying to get, we're trying to solve problems in this country with, uh, with uh, uh, political uh, agendas and so social programs or whatnot, you know, what's going to change the, this country for the better is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And isn't it interesting that this country is falling further and further downward, following the, the, the Britain and the way they went, they went, because it corresponds to our drifting away from the Bible and Jesus Christ and biblical Christianity. And thus the country is going down further and further as the country drifts away from the Bible, which this country was established based upon the Judeo-Christian ethic. And people, whether they were even Jefferson and Franklin who were not Christians, they had respect for the Bible. And in our country, you're laughed at for communicating the Bible. And uh, in, in, in some parts, in southern parts of this, in the Bible Belt, you don't see that as much, but it's getting more and more prevalent there too, just like it is in the rest of the country. So, uh, so therefore, the, the, the gospel is going to solve the social, political, economic, and environmental problems that the world has and our country has. Why? Because 
the reason why we have these problems is because of sin, we're sinners, and Satan and his cosmic system rule this world. And Jesus, who is the subject of the gospel, through his crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and session of the right hand of the Father, has uh, delivered the human race from sin, Satan, and his cosmic system. And you can experience that deliverance through faith alone and Jesus Christ alone. That's why the Christian should not be afraid of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation. Romans 1, 16 and 17. And so we must be uh, about the gospel. And as pastors, we must not be talking about uh, about the, Re the Republicans' agenda or the Democrats' agenda or the Libertarians' agenda. We must be teaching the gospel. And we, you know, politics, uh, we have a right as pastors to communicate our political views, but we must suppress those if it means uh, in order that no one uh, our political views might not cause somebody not to listen to the gospel from this pulpit, your pulpit, my pulpit, any pulpit. So we don't want politics, uh, uh, conservative or liberal politics, to get in the way of people getting the gospel. That is what we need to do as Christians. So I must sacrifice my, my, my right in this country to uh, express my political views publicly. I don't because I don't want anybody to not hear the gospel from my pulpit. And that's why I, you won't hear me talk about my political views, whether it's conservative or liberal or libertarian or whatever it is. You won't hear me talking about those. You'll hear me talking about the gospel in relation to politics or in relation to government as I'm doing today. So we have here a great passage in, in, in Jude 9 where Michael the elect angel shows respect for the devil. Jude 9 presents information regarding the circumstances surrounding Moses' death, which do not appear in the Old Testament account of his death, as I mentioned before. Now, the biblical story of Moses' death is recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 1 through 12. However, it does not mention the confrontation between the devil and Michael, the archangel. So let's look at Deuteronomy 34. Look at verse 1 in the Net Bible. Deuteronomy 34, 1. Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 1. Then Moses ascended from the deserts of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the summit of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho. The Lord showed him the whole land, Gilead to Dan, and all of Naphtali, the land of Ephraim, and Manasseh, and all the land of Judah, as far as the distant sea to the Negev, and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of the date palm trees, as far as Zoar. Then the Lord said to him, This is the land I promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when I said... I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it, but you will not cross over there. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, as the Lord had said. He buried him in the land of Moab, near Beth Peor, but no one knows his exact burial place to this very day. Moses was 120 years old when he died, but his eye was not dull, nor had his vitality departed. The Israelites mourned for Moses in the deserts of Moab for 30 days. Then the days of mourning for Moses had ended. Now Joshua, son of Nun, was full of the spirit of, of wisdom, for Moses had placed his hands on him. And the Israelites listened to him and did just what the Lord had commanded Moses. No prophet ever again arose in Israel like Moses, who knew the Lord face to face. He did all the signs and wonders the Lord had sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and all his servants and the whole land. And he displayed great power and awesome might in view of all Israel. So we don't have any reference to Michael arguing over the body of Moses with the devil. And why would, Mo why would uh, you can go back to Jude 9, why would the devil want Moses' body? Uh, we really don't know. It doesn't say, the text doesn't say. I suspect that, uh, you know, when, and why would the Lord not want anybody to know where Moses was buried? Well, as uh, we uh, read a quote from Warren Worsby last week, one reason, and I think he's right, is that the Israelites, because they were so idolatrous, as evidenced by the Dead Sea, uh, the um, the Golden Calf episode in Deuter uh, Exodus 32, they would make uh, they would make an idol uh, uh, out of a shrine out of Moses' burial spot, like they do to rock stars, like Jim Morrison or something like that. That's why you look at people like George Harrison and John Lennon; there is they, their their families had them cremated. Uh, and they didn't want to have any burial site so that things like happened at Jimi Hendrix website, a uh, website, <laughs> Jimi Hendrix burial site or Jim Morrison's burial site and other people, it becomes like a shrine, you know. And so 
so therefore, th these people are very, uh, the Exodus generation was very idolatrous, so that's one reason, I think, major reason why God didn't want them, the Israelites, to know where Moses was buried. Why, was, why did Satan want this body? Well, why would he, where did he think he'd get off trying to get this body? Well, he is the God of this world. And, uh, but Michael was the, the, uh, the ruler, of the, uh, the angelic ruler over the nation of Israel. Remember, Satan and his army, his angels, are rulers over the nations of the earth, including our own. That's why you should pray for your, your leaders, because Satan is the God of this, this country. Really, he's the, uh, he, has, he has angelic beings over this country. At fallen angels. So that's First Timothy two one through seven. We should pray for our leaders. That's one major reason. And uh, so we see that uh, that uh, the uh, Michael is the, uh, the Israel is the only nation that has an elect angel over it. That's Michael the archangel. So he had authority of the body of Moses because Moses was in a covenant relationship with the Lord. However, Moses is dead. He left that body at his physical death. So that body is basically a body that's a sin nature, has a sin nature in it, and it will decay and go back into the dust of the ground. Maybe Satan was involved in genetic engineering. Maybe he's doing that now. Maybe this is what the UFO and abdu UFO abductions are all about. Uh, if you read some of these accounts, I believe that uh, that he is involved. I'm sure he is involved in that sort of thing, and uh, genetic engineering. And he, his 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 knowledge is uh, superior to human knowledge by far. So it could be that's what you know what uh, you know Satan's doing with these uh, UFO abductions. I don't know. So we can speculate about, but it's not in the Word of God. We don't really know what Satan wanted to do with this body, and so. But they, in Satan, in some respects, did have authority because he's the God of the world, and so you know he's probably saying that body is uh, is mine. But God said no and ruled in his favor. And Michael showed respect for the devil and said, may the Lord rebuke you. Now, I'm not going to say anything against you. I'm going to give it up to the Supreme Court of Heaven, and He will deal with you, and which is a good example for Christians. When someone slanders you or makes it, you're in a difficult situation, uh, you should give it up to the Lord and let the Lord fight. And I'll tell you right now, He fights pretty good. Uh, the Lord will, uh, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to retaliate when some people slander you. I've been the objects of slander by people. I let the Lord deal with them, and some of these people don't live anymore. And I'm sad to say. And there were Christians that did the slandering, and there are people who did. Uh, uh, I've seen this with other pastors, where people are going after other pastors in the Christian community, and these people don't live anymore. The Lord, they died, they sinned to death. So you got to be careful. Don't mess with the Lord and with the Lord's people. And the, the Lord's anointed. You know, don't mess with pastors. Don't try to drag, take them on. Let the, you know, there's, there's a pro, church discipline. You need to hold them accountable. Matthew 18, 15 through 17. But don't get into this slandering these things and false accusations that people get involved with today. The Lord will, is watching over, the, is, walks in the midst of the lampstands, and he will deal with you. So be careful who you're messing with. And uh, so this is very important that we pay attention to this. So we'll follow the example again, Christian, of Michael, the elect angel, and he's a ruler angel, and he showed respect for authority, and he was a ruler himself, and that's a good example for pastors. Pastors should not, uh, you know, man might have the gift to pass the teacher, but he, he's he's not fit to be a pastor over a community of believers, the Lord's people who he bought with his blood, unless the pastor himself has authority, authority orientation, and he must be sitting and submitting to authority of his pastor until he's ready to go and have his own church. And if he hasn't done that, he is not fit for the pulpit. The pastors must be leading the way as people who are authority-oriented. They show respected, respect for authority in, ver in, in different areas, whether it's the, the political uh, the authority of our, the governmental rulers, the police officer, whatnot. They must show respect for authority. So, as we look, continue with our study of this verse, verse 9, go back to Jude, verse 9. So as we pointed out in our introduction, of the epistle of Jude, Jude 9 appears to have quoted from the Assumption of Moses, or some call it the Testament of Moses, because we don't have the uh, the manuscripts anymore. So this is called a pseudepigraphic work, which is a term that refers to a large number of false and spurious writings. Those who studied uh, canonicity with me, uh, we talked about these, diff used these different terms and whatnot. We did a study on bibliology, inspiration, inerrancy, the history of the English Bible, um, can, uh, can, canonicity. We went through all those various books. So, uh, subject, excuse me. So this particular assumption of Moses, which is Jude is quoting from in Jude 9, 
is a pseudepigraphic work, and pseudepigraphic work means it's a term, this word is a term, that refers to a large number of false and spurious writings. The New Testament writers use, make use of a number of these books. For example, Jude 14 and 15, quotes from the book of, of Enoch, 1 Enoch 1, 9, and the Assumption of Moses, and an allusion from the penitence of Janes and Jambres is found in 2 Peter 3, 8. We studied that book. So Jude 14 and 15 is actually quoting from First uh, Enoch 1, 9. Look at that passage in the Net Bible. Jude 14, now Enoch, the seventh in descent, beginning with Adam, even prophesied of them, saying, look, the Lord is coming with thousands and thousands of his holy ones, the second advent of Christ, to execute judgment on all and to convict every person of all their thoroughly ungodly deeds that they have committed and all of the harsh words that ungodly sinners have spoken against them. So that's a quotation. Those verses are a quotation from 1 Enoch 1.9 and 1 Enoch 1.9 is speaking of the second advent of Christ. Of course, it should be remembered, uh, remembered that when the New Testament writers quote from these uh, people, these heathen, uh, they also quote from uh, heathen prophets and uh, poets, excuse me. So you have uh, Jude uh, 14 and 15, quoting from 1 Enoch 1, 9. Jude 9 is quoting from the Assumption of Moses. And also we saw that 2 Peter 3, 8 quotes from the penitence of, um, uh, of Janes and Jambres. Now, of course, it should be remembered again that the New Testament also quotes from the heathen poets, uh, uh, Arast, Aratus. Uh, Acts 17, 28, Menander in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, Epimenides in Titus 1, 12. Paul quotes from Epimenides. He's a, he's a heathen prophet. And uh, so, uh, a poet, excuse me. Now, truth, this is a very important principle here. Truth is truth no matter where it is found, whether it's uttered by a heathen poet or a pagan prophet or a dumb animal like Balaam's ass in, in Numbers 22, 28. Nevertheless, it should be noted that no such formula as is it, it is written or the scriptures say is connected with any of these citations, including uh, uh, 1st Enoch 1, 9, and Jude, uh, which is quoted by Jude 14, 15, or the Assumption of Moses, which is quoted in Jude 9. It also should be noted that neither the New Testament writers nor the early church fathers who followed the apostles have considered these writings canonical. So the pseudepigrapha books are those that are distinctly spurious and unauthentic in their overall content. And now that doesn't mean they don't have historical facts in them. They do, some of them, and some parents, some parts. But they're not, their overall content is unauthentic and distinctly spurious, meaning they have false doctrine in it. So even though they claim to have been written by biblical authors, they, they, or biblical uh, personages like in First Enoch, they actually don't express sound doctrine, but rather religious fancy and magic from the period between 200 B.C. to 200 A.D. And, you know, uh, the, the, so these, uh, these particular um, works, uh, pseudographic works, are, come between, are, are written between a period of 200 B.C. to 200 A.D. And First Enoch was around the first century A.D. when it, it was produced. So the Roman Catholic Church considers these books that we were talking about these pseudepigraphic works, as the Apocrypha, which is not a term to be confused with an entirely different set of books known in Protestant circles by the same name. So like 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Maccabees, we saw among, among Protestants, such as ourselves, uh, we, those are called apocryph apocryphal works. But the Catholic Church doesn't use the term Apocrypha that way. They use it with regards to the works we call in the Protestant circles as pseudepigraphic. So the actual number of these books is not known with certainty and various writers have given numbers of important ones, these pseudepigraphic works. There are at least 18 worth mentioning. I'm only going to mention a few. Uh, there's the book of uh, Adam and Eve. There's the martyrdom of Isaiah, 1st Enoch, the testament of the 12 patriarchs. We have the assumption of Moses, 2nd Enoch, and 2nd and 3rd Baruch, and 3rd and 4th Maccabees, just to name a few. Now, the fact that Jude quotes from the assumption of Moses in Jude 9, uh, the fact that it quotes from this Assumption of Moses, this pseudepigraphic work, all it does is simply verify that this event that's communicated to us in Jude 9 is historically accurate and by no means indicates that the church was verifying the inspiration of this pseudepigraphic work. 
So this is very important. Just because Jude quotes from it, Assumption of Moses in Jude 9, and just because he quotes from 1 Enoch 1, 9 and Jude 14 and 15, he's not verifying that these works, 1 Enoch and Assumption of Moses, are canonical, inspired by God. He's just simply verifying that they're historically accurate, these events, or prophecies in the case of Jude 14 and 15, quoting uh, 1 Enoch 1, 9. So Jude, remember this, Jude wrote, like the rest of the the authors of Scripture, they wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Thus, the Holy Spirit moved Jude to put this historical event regarding the confrontation between Michael and the devil over the body of Moses after his death. And this, the Holy Spirit moving him to record this event and to quote from first uh, from Assumption of Moses, verifies that this event was historically accurate, but not the work of the Assumption of Moses. So we got a great study here with with uh, Jude nine that we we've uh, wrapped up today, and we'll we'll start a study of Jude verse uh, ten on Tuesday at eleven a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So as we wrap up our study about this uh, this verse, we see if you if you look at it one more time with me, look at my translation of Jude nine. Actually, look at verse uh, verse eight. We'll look at verses eight and nine in my translation. So Jude 8 and 9 in my translation, nevertheless, despite this, in a similar manner, these also, on the one hand, are defiling their bodies, these Jewish zealots, while on the other hand, they're rejecting human governmental authority, and on the other hand, they're disrespecting angelic beings, Satan's authority. Why? Because they're delusional to their own detriment. But in contrast to them, the Jewish zealots who rejected governmental authority and thus angelic authority, and thus God's authority, but when Michael the highest ranking archangel was arguing with the devil. He was disputing over Moses' body after his death. He absolutely did not dare present a slanderous accusation. In fact, on the contrary, he said, may the Lord rebuke you. So as we close, again, what we should, what should we derive from this study as Christians? Well, this very mysterious and, and, and quite exciting passage, really, when you think about it. Look a little uh, uh, look into the angelic realm. The the, uh, the the veil has been lifted in the angelic realm for us human beings to see by the Holy Spirit through Jude. So we must respect the governmental authorities. We must respect the governmental authorities uh, that uh, that are given to us here in this country in America. We must uh, obey them unless we have biblical justification. Why? Because we don't want to uh, we don't want to disrespect Satan's authority. And, uh, and uh, Satan has authority over the nations. He's the God of this world. And he himself, Satan, is accountable to God. He's under God's authority. He can't do anything he wants. He has to run everything by God. Read the book of Job, the first several chapters. Then you look at Zechariah chapter 3. So he, he, the, he has to get a, a approval from God when he does things. And so we see that when the Christian... Uh, disrespects the authority of the government. He's disrespecting the authority of Satan and ultimately God, who's delegated temporarily authority to Satan over the nations of the earth, which will end at the second advent of Christ when Christ establishes the kingdom of God on the earth. So these Jewish zealots posed a tremendous threat to the Christian community in the, in the, the, the decade of the 60s of the first century AD. And because if they fell for the, they were seduced and persuaded to join the zealots in their rebellion, uh, they would uh, be disciplined by God, like the Exodus generation was, as we saw in verse 5. And so uh, this, this rebellion led by the Jewish zealots ended in the destruction of the nation. They know, they, Israel was not a nation again with political boundaries, geographical borders, and a central government until 1948. They were, the J temple was destroyed, Jerusalem was destroyed, as predicted by Daniel 9.26 and the Lord in his Olivet Discourse. And... Uh, they, uh, Jerusalem and the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed, Herod's temple, and the people were deported throughout the Roman Empire and to the city of Rome as uh, evidenced by the, the, uh, the depiction of the artist's depiction of Titus' triumphal procession with the Jewish captives in Rome in 70 AD. So there's, there's the, we want to avoid divine discipline, we don't want, and we also want to bring glory to God. And we do that by respecting the governmental authorities. Okay, so that's a very, very important, especially with our political turmoil that's going on in our country 
which I think is going to escalate even more in the next couple, several couple of years to, to follow. So let's close in prayer. We'll pick this up on Tuesday with our beginning of studying of Jude 10 with this great epistle. So let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that this lesson will be a great blessing to the body of Christ, bringing glory to you and your son, Jesus Christ, and ministering to your people and any unsaved that might be in the audience. And our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ,